I'm going to do the full psychological assessment of Maya Marie Harrison. Um, Because, you know, she's about to turn 41 in a couple of weeks. I never, I didn't reach out to Maya. Before I get into Maya, let me, let me abreast some of you on who I am. Because I know there's a, a number of people, not that many, but there's a number of people that don't know who I am. Um, I've been a community activist in Houston since 1993. Um, on the celebrity side, if that helps you, um, I did a, um, I advocated for uh, an endorsement deal for an actress in 1992. Because she had given a, she had given a, an endorsement to a major hair product company at that time named Avita. Her name was Jada Pinkett, and so I secured Jada's first endorsement deal in 1992, where Avita was forced to have to compensate her. I did that. I was 16 years old, and what had happened was. Uh, she did a interview in a magazine, a hair, a hair, a hair salon magazine, or a beautician magazine, and she had given a huge endorsement to Avita Hair Products. And I contacted Avita. I think that was in '92, and uh, I told him, I said, you know, this lady is a, you know, this lady's gonna be a superstar. And she's been on a couple of TV shows, and she gave uh, your company an endorsement, and I want you to compensate her. They were like, who's Jada Pinkett? And, of course, I hyped it up. But uh, I had got the magazines fresh off the, right when they were being delivered. So it was nobody going to come before me on that. And then with uh, Avita. I was telling them, make sure that, you know, when you present it to her, you let her know that this is her fan that did it for her out of Houston and my name and phone number. And um, tell her, I said, don't take the products unless you're going to contact me because I want to talk to her. And the truth is, she took the products. They gave her the information. She never contacted me. So, you know, that's the honest to God truth. But did I secure the first endorsement deal for Jada Pinkett? Yes, I did. Does she contest that? No, she doesn't. Is she aware of it? Yes, she is. But I should have got at least my phone call. I, I did want to be able to tell people I talked to her because the jettison of her career, I actually could see that. I mean, I think anybody that was a consumer or a fan could tell that Jada Pinkett was going to blow up. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, I was able to tell people, hey, this is what I did for her, and yeah, she called me, and I talked to her, but that op- that opportunity was a missed opportunity for her, and um, she definitely should have followed up on that, but yeah, that's that's where some of the activism started, um, but my biggest activism that I ever accomplished in Houston or in the state of Texas was I was... I was the first person to ever contest the Confederacy to government. Uh, and I did that in 1998 at City Hall, Houston, because I was contesting the street name named Dowling, which was named after uh, a guy named Dick Dowling or Richard Dowling. And that street abutted the Emancipation Park, and so that's why I began my studies on Dowling in, in uh, 97 and 98. And so once I found out who Dowling was, I took that fight to City Hall in Houston. And even though I was not successful in getting city government to change the name, you know, it was a one-year failed attempt on the record, in the city minutes, well known, well documented. Little would I have known, or anyone else would have known, that that kid from 1998 
historically would be the first person to contest the Confederacy to government in the entire state of Texas. Some people have talked with me and have said that it's the first person to contest the Confederacy to government in the nation. But I don't really go outside of my state. I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty set and known that I was the first person to contest the Confederacy to government in 1998. I, I think there's, there's no argument there. And even though over the years I've had, you know, there's no smoking ordinance that I wrote that I got passed in 2005, and I didn't want people to be able to smoke at bus stops and parking rides and Public transportation, I wanted public transportation to be um, smoke-free, and I believed that people had a right to breathe clean air, especially when they have to use public transportation. I'm a big advocate for public transportation. Who I am and what happened with me in my life would never have been possible without it. So, you know, but people deserve to have a smoke-free space at public bus stops. Moving on, moving on to uh, to 2014, I was hired on as a consultant for the guy that used to own the One World Trade Center. Uh, over the years, I became a consultant, really a political consultant, more than anything. But... I became a consultant for the gentleman that used to own the One World Trade Center. And, um, and I was successful in accomplishing what I was hired to do there. And it was just simply to disseminate information to him as to what an outcome of a trial would be. And although his lawyers and law firms, and although they all got it incorrect, thank God he listened to me. And he was found not guilty. Initially, they uh, were not going to allow him to go to trial. and was going to plead guilty to three days in jail. And I said, no. I said, the, the judge is going to find you not guilty. Fast forward to when he went to jail. All of a sudden, in March of 2016, I'm going through my life, you know, doing this, doing that, whatever. Drinking coffee. I get this email that shows up out of nowhere in my email account. It said, you have a direct message from at Miss Maya. Back then it was called at Miss Maya. The account was. So I was like, oh, this can't be good. This can't be good at all. Because I knew I had followed Maya for six years on Twitter. But I wasn't that level of a fan where I ever would send her a message or I didn't follow her account. I didn't go to her shows. I didn't even know anything about her. I didn't know really anything about her. I just knew she was Maya from 98. It was recommended to me when I set up the account. Click, I'm done. But I had never, ever tried any communication with I didn't even know Maya's middle name. I didn't know her last name. I didn't know any of that. So I get this email. Say you have an email from at Miss Maya. The email notification on his face did not make sense. It didn't add up at all. It was already like, why would she be emailing me? I mean, why would she send me a, a direct message? So anyways, I checked the direct message and I see that she... Obviously, has saw a little comment I made to somebody else, and it pertained to her just a little bit, but it wasn't anything major. It was something very small. It, de it dealt with marijuana. And so I thought then, at that time, I looked at the email, and I said, the email don't make sense. Certainly, maybe it's... You know, maybe it's an oversight on her part, but that's all right. I said, let me let me run a couple quick little checks, and I'm out of here. So I'll send back. She sends back. I send back. She sends back. I send back. She sends back. So, all right, so the conversation is going, okay. 
But then I realized that, you know, that her contribution to the conversation was only when she wanted to contribute, that the conversation was not controlling, that there was no equality in the conversation, in the DMs back and forth. She'll answer some DMs, some DMs she won't. She'll answer some, some she won't. And really, anybody in the realm of normalcy would have just, that's it. That would have been, you know, forget it. You, a conversation is called a conversation because it's conversing back and forth like this. Not like that, no. So then when she had the show scheduled over there at the club by downtown, I went. I didn't go for the music. I just went because I knew that I would show up and I would play my position as the fan 100%. And I said, if what I think is wrong with her, if my assessment is correct, there's no way she's going to play her position as the performer. She's going to come out of that. So I was like, let me go on up there. Now, of course, I can't go up there just on my own. I, I'm in conversation with her DM, so let me make sure I give her notice and permission so she knows I'm going to show up. Sure enough, I play my position as a fan. She come out of it. What do you want? Just unbelievable. So when I left that night, I made my decision. I said, you know what? Let me, let me do an assessment of her because I don't know anything about her. I don't know her history. I don't know her fam. I don't know her date of birth. I don't know any of this. And then to take it on to the level that I took it to is, all right, let's do it. Come on. I got my friends over here. They hyping me up. They like, hey, man, go on see what's up with Maya. See what the deal is. I'm like, man, y'all really kept track of Maya all these years. But if anybody can do it, it's me. So I said, all right. So here's the first problem. Why Maya didn't get married goes back. Why Maya didn't have kids? You got to go back to, you know, what's called child development. So, when she was 10, remember when she was 10, she got bullied by the, the ballet instructor. Remember that? Okay. But also, when she was 10 is when she told her parents that she did not want to participate in ballet and dance anymore. Maya will tell you she was only professionally trained in tap, but she also was professionally trained in ballet. I don't know why she says that. So for two years from 10 to 12, she wouldn't participate in anything anymore. She had just quit. She came back when she was 12 and let her parents know, okay, I'm ready to reenter. That had something to do with the bullying that happened from the ballet teacher for sure. And maybe that issue wasn't being addressed. But fast forward, as you remember now, if you, if you have a child and you put the child in ballet or dance at four or three years old, then that's going to make you look at the parents, right? You always, you know, you know how it is. You got the parents always putting their kids in the pageant, you know, at a young age. And that's just their thing, you know what I'm saying? Everybody knows that that is a shared vision with the parent, whether it be her dad or her mom. At that time, they were still married. Now, watch this. Look at the first job she got. A dance instructor at 14. That's not the, that's a, that's, would not have been the recommended job for her. You don't want to have 14-year-old with a, a, a job in instruction. You want to have a 14, 15, 16-year-old in, in service. Food service. I always have my kids go work fast food, go work fast food. Because I want them to know about dealing with the public. I, I want them to have good peer-to-peer -peer relationships, so on and so forth. So my kids 
hey, go work fast food. Start at fast food. They hiring. Go over there. Maya is an instruction. So she's instructing people at 14 years old. This will later on cause kind of developmental problems in, as she grows up as an adult. Now, watch this. When her parents got divorced, why did her parents get divorced? I'm assuming they got divorced for two reasons, and the most of it was centered around her. When she went to prom, you, some of y'all may have never heard this story, but when Maya went to prom, her parents wouldn't buy her a new prom dress like every other parent does. Prom is one time in life. They made, uh, I think it was Maya's mom made her make a homemade prom dress. This is a big no-no. Don't do that. Let me tell you why. Maya changed her story twice in this particular in, in, in this particular segment. One interview, she blames mom, and in the other interview, she blames herself. One interview, she blames mom and be like, my mom made me uh, make a homemade prom dress. Do not do that to your kids. Do not put your kids in that peer-to-peer -peer circle where they showing up with the homemade prom dress and everybody else got brand new prom dress. Don't do that because that will affect them as they get older and become an adult, right? So that's what happened there. And you would say, well, maybe that was an isolated incident. You know, maybe it was finances. No, no, it wasn't finances. Let's see, her dad, he had a good job. I know in these interviews, she always portrays that her dad is, you know, a money-making musician. That's not the case. Her dad actually retired from a place called Giant Foods. He had steady paycheck coming in. You see what I'm saying? So... For her parents, big mistake. But it might have been an isolated incident, so that's why I checked on that. It wasn't. Because when you go back to when she was in middle school, all the kids were getting those brand new Cabbage Patch dolls. But not Maya. Once again, Mom went ahead and got her the uh, basically a fake Cabbage Patch doll. So now we got the homemade prom dress. Now we got the fake Cabbage Patch doll. That, that's symptomatic to all the way down the line. You don't want to do that because, once again, you, you, you kind of created an inferiority there that will develop in adulthood for the child. You don't want to do that. It'd be better off not going to prom than going to prom in a homemade prom dress that the child feels inferior of. And these are what developed. So that was all, that was symptomatic through her childhood, obviously. Obviously, it was excessive. So it's, if you, it's okay if you find a balance, but if you go overboard with it, you end up getting an adult that keeps the small little apartment in California. It's real small, real inexpensive, uh, doesn't get married, cause these uh, these willpower challenges. They're not willpower challenges. Those are the that's the depriving herself going back to when she was growing up as a kid. So the reason why you you hear Maya talking about, oh, I developed this new willpower challenge and willpower challenge. No, no, who are you talking to? Who are you telling that to? Not me. Because the willpower challenge is really the, equi the, the equal of the depriving from whatever else. Not just the prom dress, not just the cabbage patch, but all the other things that you may have wanted in your child development years that mom or dad didn't give you that you thought, you know, that would have been that other peers in your circle receive. Just the normalcy. Not, oh, I want to show up in the limo. No. Oh, I want to show up in a helicopter. No. I want a Sweet 16 from MTV. No. Just the normal, basic, peer-to-peer -peer activities. Maya didn't get to experience that. You see what I'm saying? 
Now I go back, and most time I'll never bring up her brothers, because I got two brothers myself. But in this particular case, it's a must. Two brothers. Who's the oldest in the family? Maya. And the two brothers, the youngest brother is 12 years her junior. That's over a decade gap. What, what was that all about? So that's a conversation within itself. It's like, why is your youngest brother 12 years your junior? You know what I mean? So that's basically the assessment is, yeah, the willpower challenge. That's just her reverting back to depriving herself what she wanted as a kid growing up that she didn't get. There is no such thing as a willpower challenge. You don't challenge your willpower. You ever figure that out? You, what you will. Say, hey man, that's my will. Well, go on, do it then. If that's your will, do it. So the willpower challenge that she developed is challenge what your own will is. What you want in naturality. So you say, oh yeah, you know, I, I love these foods, and I love eating these foods, and oh, all of a sudden, oh, all of a sudden she becomes a vegan. Now she's depriving herself of the food that she had growing up. Let me ask you a question. Do you remember Maya through the 2000s when she came in the music business? She was 117 pounds. Right, 98, 117. And then most of the 2000s, she was 126 pounds. I don't know about you, but I didn't see any issues with Maya for that 10 years. I didn't see the need for 